The Partially Examined Life relies on your support. To find out how to help in ways that are cheap or even free for you, check out partiallyexaminedlife.com slash support. You're listening to the Partially Examined Life, episode 225. We've been discussing Simone Weil's The Iliad or the Poem of Force, 1939, and Analysis of Oppression, 1934. I wanted to juxtapose, we were talking about sort of the autonomy of the sociological versus the action of the individual. Two quotes here, one's right from the beginning of the Iliad poem, Force. To define force, it is that X that turns anybody who's subjected to it into a thing. And then from Analysis of Oppression, 159, but men are essentially active beings and have a faculty of self-determination, which they can never renounce, even should they so desire except on the day when through death they drop back into the state of inert matter. So those things together made me think that we're talking about the dynamics of force, taking it as a sort of a sociological phenomenon, then you would say, okay, well, insofar as force is active, it turns us into things. But because she's kind of an existentialist, because Dylan was just saying that the solution here to getting out of these sociological conundrums is to change the way individuals deal with each other, when you look at these two quotes together, it says that force always needs to be incomplete. Right, Unless you just actually kill somebody, you can't permanently subject them, even though she has this whole thing on slavery, making you like an object and restricting your desires and restricting what you think is possible. You're always, as an individual, going to be self-determining. He, she doesn't use the term free will in here, but she certainly could. Maybe it was epistemically problematic for her to do so. Yeah, in fact, just a little bit after what you quoted, Mark, it says, in the very essence of power is a fundamental contradiction that prevents it from ever existing in the true sense of the word. Right. I mean, even the person who has slaves is always afraid that the slaves are going to revolt. So they never have absolute power. Their power is sort of conditioned on the fact that the slaves are not going to all take up arms and just kill them. And talking about sort of the way that societies structure these things, the slave master... And the slaves both sort of increase their fear of each other because they know this is possible. Like the slave master is always afraid of the revolt and the slaves, so he has to suppress it more brutally just because of that fear. Sort of like how maybe like the United States and the Soviet Union escalated tensions just because they were afraid of the other one. Two sort of people who are trying to have power over each other, they escalate just based on the fear. She calls it an irredeemable disequilibrium, which is continually aggravating itself. I sometimes think of you know a sophisticated political conservative as somebody who's very much aware of practical contradictions. She was obviously super liberal in the sense that she's an activist. She's you know was a peacenik. She was an anarchist in every way that you could be radically leftist in her time. She was, but when we look at these essays, she decries simple solutions to these entrenched problems that the liberals are arguing against. That if you have a revolution, you're not actually going to get rid of oppression. You're just going to get new oppressors replacing the old oppressors. If you think you can just, oh, everybody should just stop fighting. War is useless. It sounds like she's she was saying war is useless. Well, everybody should just stop. Well, there are psychological things that make this near impossible, that even if you as an individual become enlightened enough, you know, maybe the solution becomes, I was reading that at the end of her life, she was reading Schopenhauer, that becomes self-denying and sort of retreat from just the chaos of the social, that the social is too big. A more enlightened age, a more enlightened race could perhaps get out of these practical contradictions, but the autonomy of the social, these well-entrenched Patterns, the teleology, the internal dynamics of power and of oppression are just overwhelming. They're not easily solved. I mean, she highlights that Marx makes this analysis as for capitalism, but I thought she was saying it's exportable. The same analysis could be made of feudalism, of pre-feudal monarchy, or it doesn't seem to matter what the social system is. In fact, she's calling for, in Anatomy of Oppression, a sort of review of history in the context of force, if you will, where we just reinterpreting the history. She mentions Eastern societies at some points, but essentially I think she's thinking of Western history, reinterpreting it in terms of force. And I believe the analysis would yield a similar critique of force in every society that would mirror the one that Marx provided for capitalism as far as alienating the individual and the mechanism of force as it moves within. 
Yeah, except for the an idealized hunter gatherer society, which pure hunter gatherer society, which our problems consist entirely of struggling against natural necessity, and the concentration of power hasn't begun. Zero division of labor means no concentration of power, and but that's sort of an ideal may not ever exist purely. But she says that even in the hunter gatherer societies, it's really not any different because nature is oppressing you in a way. Because you're not really free, you have to spend every second warding off hunger. Those societies weren't any better. We shouldn't go back to that. Once you overcome the oppression of nature and have surplus value that's when humanity starts oppressing you. So there was no free moment in human history. These hunter-gatherer societies weren't more free. They were just being oppressed by the brute facts of nature itself. But it's interesting that she sees the human oppressors as extensions of nature, even though it seems like a fundamentally different thing. And I've cried out against this myself in saying, people act like, oh, you just got to go get a job. You got to earn a living. And like, but no, these are social traditions If we have a surplus, we should be able to, this is the Aristotelian point that she's specifically arguing is naive. You know, if we could get our shit together as a society and actually work in unison instead of against each other, then we could stop oppressing each other. We could live off the surplus and not make things terrible. But she thinks there's problematic things about that. Yeah, this is in 163. Mistaken likewise in assuming that oppression ceases to be ineluctable as soon as the productive forces have been sufficiently developed to ensure welfare and leisure for all. In other words, robot slaves. In fact, she mentions mechanical slaves and says Marx is you know, basically engaged in a thought experiment, and this is what I've said before on our Marx episodes, a thought experiment about, well, hey, what would happen if we all had robot slaves? Can't we all just do what we want? And then she addresses that. Yeah, she says it would be true if men were guided by considerations of welfare, but from the days of the Iliad to our own times, the senseless demands made by the struggle for power have taken away even the leisure for thinking about welfare. There's the condition, right? The way in which human beings interact with each other are based on struggle for power, not on considerations for welfare. And therefore, you're not going to ever get the conclusion of having the productive forces yielding surplus, resulting in a decrease in the amount of work or a relief of oppression, because the conditions of existence are not oriented towards welfare at all. Right, and you can see this directly in society when there is, say, a technological improvement that allows twice as much work to happen with half as much labor, for example, in a factory, or the most obvious one in our lifetimes is the computer revolution, caused an enormous increased efficiency in work. And sort of mysteriously, what never happens is that all of the people go from working 40 hours a week to working 20 hours a week. So Marx predicted that, right, as... A period of what he called pauperization, where all of those gains would accrue to the people who hold the capital, and you'd get massive income inequality, which we've seen some of that borne out. But then the contradiction would become so great at some point, and I honestly do think your means of production have to be very, very advanced to know whether this is true. So way beyond what we have now, and again, basically robots galore, at the point where the technology is just ridiculous... What's going to happen then? And I think, and Marx thought, well, then all of that will fall apart. You can't really sustain that inequality if everyone really could live a leisurely life because there are, you know, mechanical slaves to do everything for us. And you're saying Vey disagrees with that? Because I thought maybe what you just described sounds like the kind of analysis she would give that there's a natural tendency of the ruling classes to sort of, you know, cement their power and just expand it exponentially and never give an ounce of power back to the workers, but that because the natural conditions will have changed, that when you introduce plentitude, then there actually is an opening for maybe not an actual armed revolution or something. She says that's actually kind of incidental, whether the workers rise up and strike down, but like the de facto power, I think this is the hope of the new work movement, is that with mechanization, individuals who would otherwise be workers gain de facto power. It just becomes actually physically impossible for the oppressors to keep oppressing them. And so 
whether there's an actual violent revolution and those get smacked down, or more likely, the oppressors retain some semblance, some portion of the power that they once have, you know, enough to sort of satisfy them, but the de facto power ends up exerting itself, and so you have a different power structure. I think that she completely disagrees that it'll ever happen, that increase in surplus will lead to more equality or decrease in oppression. She says, the raising of the output of human effort will remain powerless to lighten the load of this effort, as long as the social structure implies the reversal of the relationship between means and ends. In other words, as long as the methods of labor and warfare give to a few men a discretionary power over the masses. For the fatigues and privations that become unnecessary in the struggle against nature will be absorbed by the war carried on between men for the defense or acquisition of privileges. When society is divided up into men who command and men who execute, the whole of social life is governed by the struggle for power. And that division between the commanders and the executors is an inevitable part of anything beyond hunter-gatherer existence. Well, it's not affected by surplus. And not only that, I think as the means of production get more and more advanced, far from making a more equal society, it gives more power to the people who control industry. Like an automated industry completely automated and this will probably happen it's not we're not going to see completely automated in our lifetimes but more and more automated we're going to see the first trillionaire probably in our lifetimes and the reason for that is because the means of production are getting more advanced like jeff bezos would be a trillionaire if he could get rid of the workers and that's going to yield more power not less power to the people who own industry an automated industry means even greater wealth divide so yeah, you're talking about the fact that technology expands the ability to oppress, the ability to get bigger and bigger and bigger, but there still has to be a natural limit according to Vey's analysis, so that at a certain point, just like the Roman Empire got so big that there was nothing else to conquer, Amazon, for instance, will get so big that it can't continue its growth. What's not going to happen, as you say, is that then power will go to the workers, but something different will happen. I think maybe we could look at what she has to say about the Russian Revolution on 171 to try to figure out what might happen. The Russian Revolution, thanks to a singular conjunction of circumstances, certainly seemed to give rise to something entirely new. But the truth is that the privileges it abolished had not for a long time rested on any social foundation other than tradition, that the institutions arising out of the insurrection did not perhaps effectively function for as long as a single morning, and that the real forces, namely big industry, the police, the army, the bureaucracy, far from being smashed by the revolution, attained, thanks to it, a power unknown in other countries. So it might be that Bezos himself, there's a smashing down, but there'll be other contenders to sort of step up into that space. And if we're talking about something like Bezos, I guess if you got rid of him, like she's saying with the Russian Revolution, it would be at the point when he had become weak and the real institutional power would be in the automated industry itself. And so whoever took power of that would have power. And she even says it's sort of inconceivable to do a real revolution because a real revolution would be weakness triumphing over strength, which is inconceivable, right? In order to triumph over strength, you have to be stronger, in which case you're going to just become the oppressor. So you can seize control of the powerful oppressive forces, but you can't demolish them in some sense. It's inconceivable. That's her analysis of the French Revolution, right? It's not that the weak masses overcame the monarchy. It's that the conditions of existence in that society, the monarchy had weakened, and the conditions were that the revolution was amongst the strong at that point. They were the stronger ones. That's why we get the rhetoric of the silent majority. You know, whether you're Sanders or you're Trump, you got to feel like, oh, the real power is in you, my supporters, and all we need to do is get ourselves organized and assert that power, and then we can determine how things are going to run. Whether those are accurate assessments or not, they're both trying to channel this idea that it's not that the strong are going to bow down before us, the weak, but that we are, in fact, the strong ones. We just haven't realized that potential strength yet. So going back to the Russian Revolution, I guess, on this question of why were they not able to abolish oppression as was their stated goal, I would say you also have to go back and look at this evolutionary idea where immediately after the revolution, there is, of course, what they call a power vacuum or a power struggle. And sort of like we were talking about earlier, where societies, it's not always the best society that wins or the best institution that wins, but just there are certain characteristics of how somebody can win. And in that post-revolutionary period, often who will win is the person who's most brutal and ambitious and power hungry. And that sort of drives the makeup of society immediately after. The weak people 
who believe in almost like a Nietzschean, like the weak resenters of the strong, those people are never going to win the power struggle just by virtue of the fact that they're weak. So it's going to be brutal oppressors that tend to win power struggles in power vacuums. She's essentially saying that revolution is not the replacement of oppression by enlightenment. Revolution is just the replacement of oppression by a different kind of oppression. That's one of the key failings that she sees with Marxism is that at one point, she's talking about the French Revolution, which she says should be, from a Marxist perspective at least, but also more generally speaking, an example of replacing an explicitly oppressive regime with something that should theoretically have been less oppressive and egalitarian, in fact. But what happened was a new kind of terror, a new kind of oppression. And I think she actually is using the French Revolution as kind of a prototype, a paradigmatic case, saying, if this isn't where you replace oppression with a different system that doesn't oppress, then you have to ask whether it's even possible that it can be done. Right. And at the end of the essay, in some ways, she concludes that it isn't possible. But yeah, it's not an optimistic ending. Maybe psychologically, I'm a little reading in. You know, she was writing under very bleak, literal conditions in history where things looked kind of hopeless. But I don't think she's against revolutions per se. I think in some ways she thinks a revolution is the only recipe to kind of shake up these structural changes. But she's just very pessimistic because the revolutions that we've had hadn't succeeded in abolishing oppression. Well, I think revolution might be the mechanism. But I think what she's saying is, And especially in light, if you think about her analysis of the Iliad as the poem of force, where she says it's just brutally honest, naked honesty in the Iliad about how force works, then we need to be brutally honest with ourselves when we do an analysis of history and say that these revolutions haven't been successful. They haven't moved in any way towards the direction of liberation from systemic application of force that dominates all human beings, all individuals. That's a very bleak and pessimistic view, but it's legitimate. So I think what she's calling for in this particular essay is, how do we go back and reinterpret, and I think I said this in the last episode, but you know, how do we go back and reinterpret history and understand the movement of force in all of its various manifestations in these different societies, in politics, in technology, in physical violence, in religion, and then conceive of an alternative that isn't grounded in force, where the system does not exist to allow force to exert pressure on both oppressors and the oppressed. Now, of course, to get there, we'll need a revolution, but just substituting one system of force for another is not the right answer. Even if such a revolution existed, though, how would it defend itself, right? Because you need an army. You need force to exist in a society. Otherwise, unless it's a world revolution or something totally, it doesn't seem possible. How can you defend yourself? You see, I think her analysis would be, for just what Corey's saying, that under the current conditions of existence, you'd get one revolution after another, but it always would be under the direction of force as currently understood unless you change the conditions under which people relate to one another. What she's saying is, in history, that has never happened. We've never changed the conditions of the way people relate to each other. We've just substituted political systems or you know, whatever, religious systems, whatever it may be. Right, and I don't think this essay is really where she gives a positive vision. I think she does give positive visions of society in, in other essays, like The Needs for Roots. Maybe we should have read one of those. I wouldn't be so close to slitting my wrists. You were talking earlier about how she was kind of this radical revolutionary as far leftist, but she does have some very conservative views in certain areas. And we should remember that she was an extreme Christian mystic. She was extremely religious and got more and more religious as her life progressed. So she did believe in some social institutions that you could definitely see as conservative. And she even said the human soul has a need for obedience and a need for hierarchy, but it has to be willful hierarchy, non-forced. In other words, if you think about like a sports team, the players are willfully submitting to the coach and that's good. That's fulfilling part of our human needs. So there's hierarchy still in like a football team, but you're not really saying it's force that's compelling the players to obey the coach. It's the leadership. So that would be an example of replacing sort of a forced hierarchy with a natural hierarchy. 
in the sense of uh, subjects willfully following a leader that they love. Or they don't have to love, yeah, <laughs> but they have to do it willfully. How we achieve that state of society, again, you know, what kind of revolution would this have? But she does think, I believe, sort of like you were saying, the, the way that we relate to each other has to change, not just politics. I guess like the structures of force are never going to be enough changing those. The wedge into it would seem to be the aspect in which society acts back on the individual that we quoted that from the poem of force article, that these conditions of existence are such that, yes, individuals make up society and create this environment, but also society acts back on individuals. And one could imagine that you would take the tack of the right kind of social change would engineer a different way in which people interact with one another. That's actually a a kind of, roughly speaking, a very progressive way of looking at politics, right? That you can change people by changing society. And then there's, roughly speaking, the other way of saying that you'll never change the way society works. You can only manage it because society is always made up of individuals, And they act the way they act. And they don't change. Right. And you could try to characterize the latter of those as sort of a a right-leaning philosophy that changing society, that's a specifically Marxist point. I think that probably Marianne Williamson also has the thing of like, you know, we each need to become a very left-leaning person. We need to become spiritually greater. And that is what will lead to a change in society, that changing structures isn't going to do it. So I I don't know that there's anything essentially left or right tied to those two strategies. I agree with that. And I think there's a way she has, at least in these two essays, I think she has a kind of thin conception of human nature, but with a strong social construction component. I think the question for me is, you know, the way I'm reading her is when the individual exists in its relationship with nature, even though it's a relationship of force, that there is an individual fighting for subsistence against nature, there's a certain sense of I wish there was a way for me not to use the word authenticity ever again, much less in this podcast. But it's the idea that I think the individual gets effaced when the force relation shifts from the individual's relationship with nature to man against man, right? as I mentioned earlier in the previous episode. So the question is, how do we retain, how do we recover the individual out of the relations of force in a social construct that is not subsistence living? And I think that has to be the question. And I think that you could conceive of quote unquote progressive or conservative responses to that, which would be sensible. That would at least open the door to conversation about it. And I know we're not supposed to use other books here, but there was this, I think in a lot of ways her answer is through Jesus Christ. That's literally her answer. People are going to be maybe surprised. But she has this great quote in the other one that says, nobody has figured out how to do this uh, I can't remember where exactly I read this, but nobody has figured out how to do this so far, but we have to find a way to have the loving Jesus Christ without the Inquisition. She says, always before, religion has always had the two hand in hand. You can abolish religion like the Soviet Union did, but nobody has been able to figure out a way to have this sort of loving Christianity without the Inquisition version following right along with it where you try to purge the non-believers. She says, if you could figure out how to do that, and you can maybe abstract away the religion from this, say, okay, you don't have to necessarily be Christian, but how can you have a loving society that doesn't exert some kind of demonizing force against the people who don't want to join it? All the non-lovers must die. (laughs) Yeah. But that is, the history of Christianity is kind of like that, right? Well, we need our robot priests, not robot slaves. (laughs) (laughs) Wes, in 10 years, that might be the best one you've come up with. (laughs) They have them in Japan, I think. She does mention at the end of the Iliad of the Poem Force, how her analysis of the Iliad, the spirit was carried through Sophocles' tragedies and through to the Gospels. It's interesting to compare and contrast this with uh, Nietzsche's birth of tragedy, since Nietzsche, you know, he doesn't focus on the Homeric. I think he thinks the Homeric is sort of a proto, you know, something that was then building that achieved its excellence in Sophocles, whereas for they, Sophocles is like a watered down version of what's the best in the Iliad. Even the Odyssey, she says, is just a pale imitation of the Iliad. But certainly Nietzsche is not going to say that what's great about this, the truthfulness 
of this is an embrace of the truth of suffering, let's say. That's not the way Nietzsche puts it, but I think that's what you could say by embracing the Dionysian. You're not just denying it. Like the Apollonian, purely Apollonian is to say everything is pretty, just to embrace nice forms and sort of shy away from what is dirty and gritty and true about human nature, whereas the proper balance of the Apollonian and the Dionysium, as expressed in Homer and Sophocles, really grasping an important truth of existence. It's interesting that then Vey sees that as carried through into the gospel, whereas Nietzsche would see that as absolutely falsified by what the gospel is saying. We should say what she thinks is so positive, because we haven't really covered that in the Iliad. I mean, part of it is the plain depiction of force, but the other part of it is the what she calls luminous moments. So on page 206, she says, the wantonness of the conqueror that knows no respect for any creature or thing that is at its mercy or is imagined to be so, the despair of the soldier that drives him on to destruction, the obliteration of the slave, the conquered man, the wholesale slaughter, all these elements combine in the Iliad to make a picture of uniform horror of which force is the sole hero. A monotonous desolation would result were it not for those few luminous moments scattered here and there throughout the poem, those brief celestial moments in which man possesses his soul. The soul that awakens then to live for an instant only and be lost almost at once in force's vast kingdom awakes pure and whole. It contains no ambiguities, nothing complicated or turbid. It has no room for anything but courage and love. Sometimes it is in the course of inner deliberation that a man finds his soul. He meets it like Hector before Troy as he tries to face destiny on his own terms without the help of gods or men. And then she'll go on to talk about what she calls the incurable bitterness. Hey, let's stop just for a second for a little break. Simone Weil's analysis of the logic of force is squarely situated in the violent legacy of European Enlightenment at the beginning of the 20th century. It's tempting to read her as an up-to-date Kierkegaard, and that wouldn't be wrong. But her critique is more psychologically subtle than his, and informed by Marx and her active involvement in the conflicts and social movements of the time. As a complement to our reading of Weil, check out The Modern Intellectual Tradition from Descartes to Derrida at The Great Courses Plus. Lectures 13 to 16 cover her influencers, Marx, Kierkegaard, and Freud, amongst others, while in Lecture 24 on Existentialism in the Frankfurt School, you can learn about those whose thought was shaped in turn by her. As students head back to school, it's time for you to renew your love of learning with the Great Courses Plus. All the benefits of academic lectures without tests, grades, or tuition fees. They are currently offering PEL listeners three full months of unlimited access for just $30. That's only $10 a month, but you must sign up using our special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash P-E-L. That's P-E-L for Partially Examined Life. Get the details on this limited time three month for $30 offer by going to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash P-E-L. OmniFocus is a professional to-do list manager that helps you accomplish more every day. Now, I'm managing three podcasts, my job, my musical projects, family obligations. This can be a lot. OmniFocus is a great tool for managing all that. OmniFocus for iOS runs on iPhones, iPads, and it syncs with OmniFocus for Mac and OmniFocus for the web. So it includes the basics of what you'd think such a program would have, like actions, projects, flagging, due dates, notes, batch editing, but also adds a second layer of organization You can see everything tagged with a person, for a location, an energy level, whatever you choose. And it's got this cool forecast view that helps you plan the next few days and shows you what you need to do right now, today, or see all the items you've flagged. Uh, There's a review mode. You can periodically go through your projects, make sure your plans are all up to date so nothing slips by. And there are notifications. They remind you when something's coming up so you don't have to keep checking the app. And hey, it includes an app for Apple Watch and support for Siri and Shortcuts. This is a very cool app. It'll lower your stress level because OmniFocus remembers everything for you, enable you to plan your life better, get your work done on time. Why not try it out? Go to OmniFocus.com. Finally, I want to tell you more about Mint Mobile, which I have now been using for over a month now and am very happy with. If you were using one of the big wireless providers in 2019, what are you paying for? There's expensive retail stores, inflated prices, hidden fees, 
you are being taken advantage of because they know you will pay. Mint Mobile provides the same premium network coverage you're used to, but at a fraction of the cost because everything is online. So they save on retail locations and overhead, pass those savings directly on to you. Your wireless bill can be a mere $15 a month. Every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text. You can choose between plans with 3, 8, or 12 gigabytes of 4G LTE data. Stop paying for unlimited data you'll never use. Now, I got this when I got a new iPhone. It was super easy to set up. It rides on the back of the T-Mobile network, so I was using AT&T before. It's pretty darn comparable, and of course, much, much, much cheaper. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan. Keep your same phone number, your existing contacts to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door free. Go to mintmobile.com slash P-E-L. That's mintmobile.com slash P-E-L. 15 bucks a month. Mintmobile.com slash P-E-L. And now let's get back to the show. You might think the Iliad is like praising war. Like what an exciting war adventure story. And she sees it as a wholesale condemnation of war by showing in stark detail how it's screwing everybody up. Right. I love how she points out that Homer writes the non-war passages poetically and beautifully, and he writes the war parts. He just writes what happens about the blood. There's no dressing it up. Even in the language of the Iliad is not really structurally praising war. It's like the war parts are just written down as disgusting brute facts of reality. And obviously it's like the non-war parts, the dreams and the hopes of these people are the beautiful parts for Homer, I guess, according to her analysis. Yeah, and actually the quotation I was going to read is right before that where she talks about the poetry stuff. So she says on page 208, it is in this that the Iliad is absolutely unique and this bitterness that proceeds from tenderness and that spreads over the whole human race, impartial as sunlight. Never does the tone lose its coloring of bitterness, yet never does the bitterness drop into lamentation. Justice and love, which have hardly any place in this study of extremes and of unjust acts of violence, nevertheless bathe the work in their light without ever becoming noticeable themselves, except as a kind of accent. Nothing precious is scorned, whether or not death is its destiny. Everyone's unhappiness is laid bare without dissimulation or disdain. No man is said above or below the condition common to all men. Whatever is destroyed is regretted. Another really beautiful passage in her essay. These are the things that when we talk about what's preserved in Attic plays or in the Gospels, this is the type of thing that she is thinking of. It's also interesting to say where she thought broadly European culture or European history went wrong after the Iliad, which is to pretend that suffering and force or suffering in particular could be avoided. So she thought even Christianity went wrong when it said, look, if you follow these rules and love God, you'll somehow avoid suffering. And rulers went wrong where they thought, well, look, if you're on our side, you can somehow avoid this fate. So maybe the difference between her and Nietzsche about this is very much the same that we've said many times between Nietzsche and Schopenhauer. What she thought was great about the Greek or unique about the Greek culture at that time is that they all knew that suffering was simply a fact of life and nobody could avoid it. So that was something that she thought was lost somehow in the culture. Yeah, this is at the bottom of page 212 and on page 213. Uh, In 212, she's characterizing in the terms of the Gospels, she says, the sense of human misery is a precondition for justice and love. And at the bottom, she says, the relations between destiny and the human soul, the extent to which each soul creates its own destiny, the question of what elements in the soul are transformed by merciless necessity as it tailors a soul to fit the requirements of shifting fate and of what elements can, on the other hand, be preserved through the exercise of virtue and through grace. This whole question is fraught with temptations to falsehood, temptations that are positively enhanced by pride, by shame by hatred, contempt, and indifference, by the will to oblivion or to ignorance. Moreover, nothing is so rare as to see misfortune fairly portrayed. The Greeks, generally speaking, were endowed with spiritual force that allowed them to avoid self-deception. Basically, to see the poem of force rendered as truly and authentically and fairly as it could be. And she thought there was something unique about the Greeks, I guess, that 
could write something like this. Like if we were to write it today as a Hollywood movie, it's like there would be some way for the characters to escape the force or there'd be some moral lesson where, man, if you could just be good, you can escape it. And the Greeks are like, no, force consumes everyone. All the characters weep and suffer in the end because that's intrinsic in life somehow. Yeah, right at the beginning of this section, I should have read this part first. In any case, this poem is a miracle. Its bitterness is the only justifiable bitterness, for it springs from the subjection of the human spirit to force, that is, in the last analysis, to matter. This subjection is the common lot, although each spirit will bear it differently in proportion to its own virtue. No one in the Iliad is spared by it, as no one on earth is. She says the Odyssey is only a good imitation of this. (laughs) Yeah. Not only was there something uniquely Greek about it, but apparently they only were able to write one. Seems a bit of an exaggeration. There's no revival of Greek genius in the Renaissance. (laughs) No, nothing else was ever good in history except for the Iliad. Shakespeare and a few others come close, but yeah. She does point to Aeschylus and Sophocles as being the truest continuation of the Homeric epic as in the Iliad. This was Homer's most positive review of any of his books. (laughs) (laughs) So do you think the difference between Ve and Nietzsche in Birth of Tragedy here might come down to something like the difference between Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, that they're both sort of lauding the same picture, but they just disagree about what the appropriate reaction to this is? I mean, certainly by Ve talking about that you have to understand suffering to know love, interpreting that as Christian love, that seems very different than what Nietzsche is saying, but of course... Nietzsche has love of fate and things in there. Maybe there is something that's not as different as might appear, given that he's so anti-Christian. Yeah, I'm not sure they view Christianity the same way. It's hard to say really what their difference is, because he's so anti-Christian, but would he be against the kind of Christianity that she's claiming comes out of the Iliad? It seems like a different vision of what Christianity is. And I think she was also very down on Christianity through much of history, too. So it's not like she was in favor of institutional Christianity or the Christianity that most people practice. She was very extreme in her Christian faith. She didn't think you could just go to church. And I don't think she would have liked this kind of Christianity where you, in Nietzsche's view, are sort of resentfully worshiping weakness. She thought we should do revolutions. You know, she joined the Spanish revolution, like I said, and thought about taking up power and changing society. So it's not like she thought we should just pray and love each other and be nice. You know, she was an active part of the world and in fact wanted to, in a Nietzschean way, sort of take that will to power and create a world in her vision. And she thought that was part of Christianity, but somehow finding it a way again to do it without the Inquisition. So yes, she is very Nietzschean in ways, but I think they have a very different view on what Christianity is. And she in some ways thinks we can save Christianity, I guess, from itself. So closer to Kierkegaard, but you know, I'm sure there are interesting contrasts there as well between her obvious activism and his maybe not so much so. She's not as individual focused, I guess, as Kierkegaard. She believes in society and uniting the entire earth. Just looking back to that, we were just saying about individuals. I mean, what in the poem of Force, she's saying that there's a big chunk in the, near the beginning of it where she's talking about why are they so merciless, right? When you have power and somebody kneels before you, wouldn't it be magnanimous to say, you know, just revel in your power, basically, and not kill the person? But she says, whether somebody lives or dies is a matter of your whim, then you're in a mode where you are not stopping to reflect. Your humanity has been degraded by the use of force in such a manner that you can't even reflect on how this is actually a human being in front of you. This is page 204. There's a good quote here. To respect life in somebody else when you have had to castrate yourself of all yearning for it demands a truly heartbreaking exertion of the powers of generosity. Part of the cost of war is this cost to the soul that she describes, where you've sort of given up on life. The other way she puts it, if the existence of an enemy has made a soul destroy in itself the thing nature put there, then the only remedy the soul can imagine is the destruction of the enemy. Our psychological, our spiritual costs are too great, and that's part of what feeds the self-perpetuating quality of force and power. 
is that we need compensation for what it does to us, this thing-making aspect that it has. Right, and I think she talks about a lot sort of the psychological impacts of this. Like she, One of the ways where she said non-Greek cultures have gone wrong is thinking that suffering can leave you unmarked, like psychologically ruined. Like you're saying in that moment, why do you kill the person? Wouldn't it be more magnanimous? Well, psychologically, these people become so wrapped up in their power that it takes almost like a Christ-like figure to resist it. And she says, like, only a few times have people in history, like Marcus Aurelius, she says, sort of been able to resist that. And she's like, there's something built into human nature, broadly speaking, or our psychology that just our minds are sort of maybe too weak to not get wrapped up in the overwhelming sort of euphoria of the force and we become irresistibly drawn to it and it would take almost like a superhuman person to be put in charge of the power structure and be able to resist the influences of the power structure itself and just do it magnanimously towards the good of all mankind which is why these oppressive societies can never get abolished because in some sense the leaders get totally absorbed in the mechanisms of the revolution or whatever, and they become despotic. Like in the French Revolution, they start chopping off everyone's heads. It's like, who could have resisted the urge to do it? Why did they all behave like this? It wasn't like one bad guy got in charge. When they chopped off the next guy's head, the next group of people were the same. So there's something structural about the force that exerts incredible pressure on our psychology and it would take just a superhuman figure to resist that and perhaps even if a figure did arise maybe they would just get killed by the other figures yeah is being christ-like and being reflective are those the same thing i was thinking here of this is going to be a little bit of a weird association it might sound like (laughs) but people saying i've said to people well there's no reason a busboy should make less money than me you know, it's interesting that a lot of my friends who think of themselves as leftists, they, they rebel at that idea. And the thing that irks them is the idea that they've worked really, really hard to get where they are. Which is a weird thing to say because if obviously busboy, if you're making a living as a busboy, that's really, really hard work. You know, I gave a lot of thought about, well, what's going on there psychologically? And I think what they mean is there's a particular thing that you do to yourself when you participate in the hierarchy game What you give up is spiritual, in other words. What they're saying is, the person who's not ambitious isn't tortured by the same things as I am. I deserve compensation for what I have done to myself uh, (laughs) by virtue of my relationship to hierarchy and power. I really... This is long before this this episode came up. This is what I started to think about this, and it kind of fits with Vey's analysis here. She gives this great example of, I think it's Hector begging for his life with Achilles, but it may be someone else, and Achilles just responds in this very casual way, come friend, you two must die. Why make a fuss about it? And he says, Patroclus has died, and I'm really noble, and you know, my I have a goddess for a mom, but the hour that comes when one day some arms-bearing warrior will kill me. It's this idea that death is normal and ubiquitous, and one is already dead, in a sense. One is already dead before force. Force has taken something so psychologically or spiritually dear away from you that there's no real moral calamity in imposing that on someone else. And in a way, it seems like justice, not just for Patroclus is dead, so I'm going to have to get revenge. It's like, I am dead, and therefore I'm going to take it out on you. And you see this socially in the sense that this power game does something to me, and therefore I feel less of a burden about feeling empathetic for other people. I can always say, well, at least they're not playing the power game because they're on the bottom of the hierarchy. They may be thingified in the passive sense of being the victims of power, but hey, at least they're not thingified in the way that I am as force, as momentum. I know this isn't exactly it, but I think you're right about the interpretation of that section, but it makes me think that it amounts to Achilles saying to Hector, this hurts me way more than it hurts you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I think all this talk about, uh, we're all going to die, it's just, it's fate, is self-deluding. And so if you're going to say that the Iliad is so honest in its portrayal, well, then you have to say that Homer's position here, the position that you're supposed to get out of it, 
is that these people are self-deluding themselves, that when they talk about fate, they're, well, in a shorthand, according to Vey's analysis, they're referring to the autonomy of social systems and power and things above any one person's motivations regarding them. And that's a truth. But the way they actually talk about it, like, oh, all men must die. And so I'm going to, like, they're expressing, I think, some kind of nihilism. And so it's very unclear to me. We could just, you know, let's have an Iliad episode where we revisit this, but that I could very well read this. And when a character is saying something that sounds philosophical, then like, well, that's the philosophy that Homer is espousing. That's what he's telling us. He's not making a comment that Achilles is a deluded fool talking about fate. He's actually saying this is one of the lessons of the Iliad is that fate rules us all. We're all mortal, blah, blah, blah. So I think you have to give a very sort of half reading of this to say, oh, what an honest portrayal of suffering and war this is. And that honesty has never been repeated in anything else. Like I can, I can think of a lot more even modern commentaries on war that seem pretty goddamn honest without these interpretive difficulties that I'm referring to. Well, I think she's also getting at the non-moralizing element of the Iliad, which would be very rare in any modern contemporary account of war. I mean, moralization is a distortion. So if the Iliad were a straight up horrors of war narrative, I think it wouldn't fit the bill. But I do think that, you know, you mentioned nihilism, Mark. I think she is arguing that power induces nihilism, that what happens to warriors is they do essentially become nihilistic. And you see that in Achilles' kind of ad- casual attitude there. Come, friend, you too must die. And I think her point about the Iliad is it's not that it's abstaining from moralizing, it's a narrative from neither point of view. It's not the narrative of the Greeks, it's not the narrative of the Trojans. It's a neutral narrative that just lays bare the tragedy and the bitterness and the misery across all sides. And so when she talks about the Odyssey and the Chanson de Guest and the Chanson de Roland and all these other things, what she's saying is they're from somebody's point of view, which necessarily means that there's a perspective of a hierarchy or evaluation of Roland's death is worth more than the death of the Saracens or whoever it is that's in that. And she does a really interesting thing when she closes the essay where she basically says that this is quintessentially Greek and she talks about Aeschylus and Socrates, but she carries this through to Christianity and talks about the Greek aspects of the Gospels and how she thinks that the Gospel of Christ also tells the same story of bitterness, but that it doesn't refrain from creating a narrative point of view It essentially takes the story of the Iliad of force, but then puts the Christian metaphysics on top of it. And that that's actually one of the more severe perversions that you could possibly do, because it's not simply creating a narrative where you're valorizing one person's experience over another, but that you've actually concretized this hierarchy and this value system. You've essentially validated the application of force in the metaphysics. And this is the point at which I think it ties more closely to Nietzsche by saying that there are the oppressed and there are the oppressors and that you try to value the oppressed over the oppressors in the Gospels, but that it fails. Right, and she also says, again, the way the Gospels went wrong is that they gave us an out, where if you follow Christ and you believe, you will escape the necessary suffering of the uncontrollable forces of the world. And she doesn't think you will. She thinks it's inescapable like the Greeks. The beginning of the Iliad is not personal. Whatever the voice is saying, come listen to the rage of Achilles, the story of the rage of Achilles. Anger be now your song, immortal one. Achilles' anger, doomed and ruinous. Oh, look, you memorized it. Caused the king's loss and bitter loss. (laughs) Very fancy. I thought you Johnnies learned it in Greek. Many I did say, ah, Pleiade o Achilleos. Oh my God, I love Wes. Yeah, well, you're not as cool as Simone who learned Greek as a child. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love the fact that Simone de Beauvoir and Simone Vi took their logic exams at the same time in college and they placed number one and number two. Vi, number <laughs> one, and 
De Beauvoir number two. And they were the only two women in the school, too, from what I understand, or two out of three, because it was a, I guess it was that like women weren't even allowed to attend officially, but everyone just tolerated it. So they were kind of there. So it was hundreds of men and then these two women who had decided to go and they got one and two. It's obviously sort of takes a remarkable person to be probably one of the first two women, you know, who are sort of allowed in this school. So that's probably why they outperformed, I believe, you know. I read something about her her younger brother was a super genius that he famous that mathematician. She, yeah. Yeah, and she was very bitter at the fact that uh she was not a genius. Yeah, exactly. And he, because he was reading Greek fluently and, you know, as a child and it's just it was like nothing to him. And all this other stuff, apparently. So. Henri is his name. He contributed to mathematics extensively, I believe. And by the way, just to add to that, she did all of her stuff. She died when she was 34, right? She produced an amazing amount of work in, in 15 years. Late bloomer. Someone, someone who's yeah young. There's weird controversy about how she died, that she wouldn't eat. She was trying to be like the troops and sympathize with them and not eat. And so it's... I thought it was tuberculosis. Well, yes, that's the thing. So just what I was reading about her, I think just on Wikipedia, was that you know at the time, the coroner was like, it, she did self-harm by refusing to eat. Like that she she died for love, somebody else is saying. But somebody else, according to this Wiki article, like or maybe it was Stanford, said... No, it was just tuberculosis and she got sick and she couldn't eat. It's not that she was engaging in some sort of... She had just been reading Schopenhauer and thought that denying yourself food... Well, it wouldn't be the first. She had done hunger strikes, I think, before. But yeah, according to the mythology, she starved herself to death out of solidarity with the the soldiers or something. I'm, you know, Most likely not literally true. Given the state of the world at the time and her empathies, I'm sure she wasn't as healthy as she could, she, she might have been. Well, if I'm ever unable to eat, I'm definitely going to say it's that I'm in solidarity with someone. <laughs> <laughs> You've just been reading your Schopenhauer and think that this is <laughs> the mythological version of how she died, which again, I really, you know, come on, uh, sort of wraps up perfectly though in a almost a Homeric sense or life. I think that's why it's appealing to people. And then she starved herself to death, you know, in this very dramatic suffering way. At least does seem true that she got to the U S she brought her parents to the U S and she could have just stayed in the U.S. and kept writing, but she decided she needed to be back in the action, and so she went to England to work on the side of people who were resisting the Nazis from France, and so at least it seems reasonable that the whole reason she would be in a position where she would get tuberculosis and all this is because she, she had such a devotion to her causes and was putting herself out there in a way that if, you know, merely as like Nietzsche and Kierkegaard sitting back and just writing as much as possible might have been a different course of events. She did refuse to drink wine and refuse to eat meat and all this stuff because the soldiers didn't have wine and meat. So she did put herself, she also, uh, her Christianity has sort of an asceticism to it where she willfully subjected herself to suffering to understand the suffering of others. She also joined a factory when she was younger just to put herself through the suffering of these horrible factory conditions to understand the conditions of the workers when she was trying to be sort of a Marxist. So she, throughout her entire life, definitely did willfully subject herself to suffering in order to understand the suffering of the world. That was the theme. So the fact that she killed herself in the end through not eating, even though it's probably not true, like I said, would certainly fit in very well with the theme of her life. She willfully was never afraid to put herself in danger or to inflict suffering on herself. And even like I said, when she was five years old, she refused to eat sugar because the soldiers in World War I didn't have sugar. I think she was nine years old. So that was part of her psychology or something her entire life is to have solidarity with people, not just in ideas, but to literally put yourself through suffering to understand what other people are going through. So Corey, you had recommended originally that we read The Need for Roots. We didn't pick that partially because it was just too long. Although what I have heard about that book is that it's just a bunch of journal entries or, you know, private writings that somebody else cobbled together. So there would be, you know, there's no integrity to the text as a whole, such that taking sections out of it and reading those individually would harm it, presumably in any way, because of her short life. And I just figured like, this is our Vey episode, but now I'm feeling like I just, I was excited enough about her. Would you recommend a future episode on the need for roots? Yeah, I would. And the reason for it is because 
These two essays that we read today are just intensely pessimistic and have no positive vision of society. We're, it's our lot in life. I mean, the oppression essay ends with, and that's how it is. We're going to always be slaves. We're born slaves, and that's human's fate. So if, That's a direct quote. <laughs> yeah. If we're interested in looking at what she thought society might look like in the positive sense, she does sketch out, that was supposed to be her manual for society. And it, supposedly she uh, presented it to like Charles de Gaulle. She was working in the French resistance. And he sort of, they sort of read it like, I don't get it. What the hell are you talking about? You know, nobody really paid attention to it. But then I think Camus read it later and thought it w- could be like a textbook for how to build this kind of society that we're talking about she was dreaming of at this time. She outlines definitely a positive vision of society there. So it's a lot different than the two essays that we read today. Yeah, I would love to do more. She's a super underrated philosopher, I think. If you read The Needs for Roots, some of the stuff you read is going to surprise you in what her opinions were. It's not the kind of stuff that you read typically in political philosophy. Like a lot of her opinions are pretty eclectic and but very interesting. I refused to eat peas when I was five. I just want to put that out there. I also and, did. Um, yes. In solidarity with someone. In solidarity with people who think peas are gross. <laughs> yeah. And I, I opted to not do the factory thing. I was a busboy instead for a summer. Um. All right. Next time, we're going to read Sir Francis Bacon's Novum Organum. Our closing song, fittingly enough, is Throw Down the Sword. It's by Wishbone Ash from their 2019 40th anniversary concert live in London album. I interviewed Andy Powell, the leader of that band at this point, for Nakedly Examined Music episode 51. Check it out at nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. Folks should uh, comment on what else they want us to cover. Their thoughts about this episode, you can do that at partiallyexaminedlife.com. There's a blog post corresponding to this episode that you can comment directly on, or you can go to our Facebook group, or follow us on Twitter, or email us directly at pel at partiallyexaminedlife.com. Thanks, Corey, for joining us and suggesting this topic. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. I was glad to be on. Thank you, Corey. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night.
csörézem, 